Good evening, everybody. It's great to welcome you to Little Hill Church, whether you regularly come here or you're visiting us. It's so good to see you. Great to see so many faces that I recognise and lovely to know that we can come together to worship God, to remember God's great gift to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you are local or you've travelled further or you're joining us online this evening, a very warm welcome to you. Glad that you're able to come as we meet together to worship God. It's great to have Gary Prickett, the pastor of Oadby Evangelical Church, with us. And Gary is going to be preaching, bringing God's word to us later on this evening. So, Gary, thank you. We look forward to what God has laid on your heart to share with us this Good Friday evening. As we come to worship God and focus our minds on why it is that we're here this evening, let me read some words from Lamentations chapter 1, just one verse. The prophet Jeremiah says, Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. These very much could be the words of the Lord Jesus Christ as he is on the cross. There, because of the will of God, there, because of our sin, there, because... There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. And that he was the only one who could open up the gates of heaven for us to let us in. So here we are encouraged to look and to see. And our first song this evening has that theme. Come and behold, come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the king. If you're able to stand as the music starts to play, please do stand and we'll, we'll bring our praise, our worship and our wonder and thanks to God who has so loved us. Thank you. Before we come to God in prayer, let me just read some words from Isaiah 53. And 
these words that are very familiar. Let me just change some of it to make it more personal for us. You'll see what I mean as I go through. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hid their faces or as one from whom I hid my face. He was despised and we, I, esteemed him not. Surely he has borne my griefs and carried my sorrows. Yet I esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for my transgressions. He was crushed for my iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought me peace. And with his wounds I am healed. Like sheep, I had gone astray. I had turned to my own way. And the Lord laid on him my iniquity. Through knowing him, the righteous one, the servant of the Lord, I have been counted as righteous because he bore my iniquities. He bore my sin and he made intercession for me. That's our testimony as God's people if we're in Christ. That he was pierced for my transgressions, crushed for my iniquities. Let's bow before the God who shows us such grace and mercy. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this evening as we've looked in just such a small part at this great mystery of your Son coming into the world. Father, we hear those words, as it were, from the mouth of your Son on the cross. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Was there ever such suffering like this? Look and see. And we've sung, come, behold, the wondrous mystery, Christ the Lord upon the tree, in the stead, in the place of ruined sinners. And that is what we are before you in our own standing. We are ruined sinners. But there in our place hangs the lamb in victory. Father, as we come this evening to consider the price of our salvation, as we come to think and meditate upon that great plan that you had even before you created the world, we bow in awe and wonder before you. Father, like Isaiah earlier on in his prophecy, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, recognized how undone he was before you, we are undone in your presence. And yet in Christ you welcome us. And we want to praise you and worship you and thank you for the great gift of your son this evening. We've come to praise you and thank you that he was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. That the chastisement for our sin that's brought us peace was laid upon him and not upon us. That it's with his stripes we have been healed. Father, we are the ones who turned away and rejected you. But you laid our sin on your dear precious son. Father, sometimes it's too much for us to take it in. How could it be that God would love us so much? That you are a God of infinite love. A God of infinite truth. And we thank you that your justice was fully satisfied in the death of your son. Who died in our place. What a foretaste of deliverance as we think of Christ upon that cross, as we think of the God of life slain by death, we praise you that the grave could not hold him and that he is alive. Father, this evening we've come to worship you. We've come to exalt and lift high the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was humbled lower than we could ever imagine, even to the point of death on a cross. But how we praise you that now he has been lifted high and exalted, higher than we could ever dream. And all the glory and honour belongs to him. So as we come to worship you now, hear our prayer. Help us as we remember the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Make it real to us and fresh again, we pray. And bless our time as we come gathered together as your people. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's sing again of the Lord Jesus. It's... Uh, a very familiar hymn, a very thought-provoking hymn, Man of Sorrows, what a name. Again, if you're able to stand as the music plays, please do.
I said it at the start, I'm going to say it again. It's really good to see you all. Thank you for coming this evening. It's so encouraging when as local churches we can meet together at times like this to worship God. We love the Lord. We love his word. We love proclaiming Christ. We love bringing glory and honour to our God in heaven. And it's so good when we have these occasions to come together uh, for those things to be at the heart of everything that we do together. We are individual church families, but we're one church family. And we're united in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's so good to see you. Please don't rush off afterwards. Uh, hopefully we've started early enough for you to be able to stay a bit behind after and have some refreshments and time together. It's, it's good when we have these opportunities to catch up and find out what's been going on uh, and to... Uh, be encouraged in what the Lord is doing in the different parts of the city uh, where he's put us. So please do uh, stay after if you're able to. If you have children with you, uh, there's a room here just to my right. Um, that's not to say please take them out at all. It's great to see children here. Love to see the children in the service. But if you felt you needed to, um, I think the heating's come on in there. It's warmed up. There's a screen as well that relays the service so you won't miss what's going on. But uh, use that if you feel you'd, you'd like to as well. Let's read from God's Word together. If you have your Bible, we have a reading from the Old Testament book of Le Leviticus. And then we'll read some verses from Hebrews chapter 10 as well. So the first reading is from Leviticus chapter 16, verses 2 to 5. And then we'll jump to Hebrews chapter 10. And these readings will have a bearing on what Gary's going to bring from Mark's gospel uh, a little later on. So Leviticus 16 verses 2 to 5. And then to Hebrews 10 verse 19 to 23. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way Aaron shall come into the holy place, with a bull from the herd for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat, and shall have the linen undergarment on his body. And he shall tie the linen sash around his waist, and wear the linen turban, these are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And then to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10, 19 to 23. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Amen. Two incredible, two incredible things that we've read of, and may God bless the reading of his word to us. Let's come again to God in prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the the privilege that is ours to be able to read your word in our language. So often, Heavenly Father, we take it for granted that we can take perhaps one of many Bibles off the shelf at home and read and understand what your word is saying to us. And yet your word is a precious gift. We thank you that it is the living word of God. We thank you that your word is living and active. Thank you that it's a word that changes lives. Thank you that it's through your word that we know of Christ because the Apostle Paul made it very clear when he said to Timothy that the scriptures are able to make you wise to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. 
Father, thank you that in these precious words is life. But we thank you mostly that they speak to us of Christ, who is the living word, the one who is the word become flesh. And we praise you and thank you, Father, that we've come together in his name to worship you this evening. We've come together in his name, and it's in his name that we draw near to you. We come to you in the name of Jesus. We come to bring you our thanks and our praise. Father, thank you for this week that's been. Some here of the, the churches represented have had their holiday Bible clubs this week, have been able to share the precious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with the children and young people of their communities. And we thank you for that opportunity. We thank you for those who've come and heard the message and listened carefully. We thank you for the memory verses they've perhaps learned from your word that will stay with them. And we pray, O oh God in heaven, that your Holy Spirit might be busy and active to bring that precious seed to life, that it would find good soil in their hearts, and that you would have mercy on those who've heard your word this week. Father, we think of the opportunities next week. We know here at Little Hill with our Holiday Bible Club next week, we pray for your blessing, and we pray for your help. We pray for the work of your Holy Spirit in all that we do. Lord, we all recognise that we cannot do anything to bring anyone to salvation. It's the work of God only to be faithful on our part to make the gospel of Christ known. Father, we think of the opportunities that we will have over this weekend, especially on the Lord's Day as we meet together to celebrate and rejoice that Christ is risen. And we pray, O oh God, that you would bring many people into our churches, that perhaps just because it's Easter Sunday and, and maybe they're feeling nostalgic or traditional, whatever their reasons, bring them in, we pray. May the reason be that you have made a divine appointment to meet with them in that service. Oh, our God, bless the preaching of your word, that those who will be preparing to bring the gospel on Sunday morning or Sunday evening would know uh, the power of the Holy Spirit as they study, as they pray, as they prepare, that you would send your word out and that it would achieve all that you have planned and purposed for it. Father, bless your word amongst us this evening. Be with Gary as he comes to preach your word to us in a few minutes' time. We thank you for him. We pray that you would use him to be a channel of your blessing and encouragement and challenge to us this evening. That the word that you've given him, you would send out with great power. And God in heaven, make us ready to listen. Help us to be alert. Give us minds that are fresh and receptive. And we pray, O oh God, that you would work in us to help us receive your word with faith, with gladness, with joy, with thankfulness and with humility and obedience, that we would do all that you would command us. Father, keep us faithful as your churches. Oh Lord, how it's so tragic that so many seem to be turning away from the truth. Lord, your word is truth. Your Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. You sanctify us through the truth. We need the truth. Keep us faithful to the truth. And Father, this gathering this evening is such a wonderful blessing to us to be able to meet together in this way. And as we pray for one another, as we pray for our churches, as we pray for the opportunities, as we pray for the individuals who make up the church families that are represented here this evening, oh our God, would you have mercy upon us? Would you help us to grow in faith and love and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Would you help us in the opportunities that we have to make Christ known? But Father, this gathering this evening reminds us of our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world who can't meet together like this. And Lord, we would pray for them this evening. We pray for our brothers and sisters who, for them, the words of the Lord Jesus to take up their cross and follow him are a real daily experience. And Lord, we ask that you'd have mercy upon them. We pray that even if they're isolated and on their own, not able to meet with other believers as they remember the death of the Lord Jesus this evening, we pray, O oh God, that you might draw near to them and comfort them that the presence of your Holy Spirit with them would be such a blessing and a comfort and a help, that they might know your peace, that they might know the promises of your word to be with them, that you surround and encamp around your people. May they know your deliverance, may they know your help, and may they know your strength. We remember them this evening. And our God, as we come before you, we pray that you would forgive our many sins. We're remembering Christ dying for us today because we're sinners. And we pray that you would have mercy upon us because of him. We pray that you would wash us clean in his precious blood. 
We pray that as we look to Christ, as we look to the cross, we would turn from sin as we see Christ more and help us to walk in obedience and joy before you. So our God, please hear our prayer. Accept our thanks. Do as good, we pray. Glorify your name in your church. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again before I hand over to Gary. It's a lovely hymn, a very familiar hymn. Here is love, vast as the ocean. And when we sing hymns that are familiar to us, really think about the words. It's easy sometimes just to sing them, isn't it? The poetry is beautiful and moving at times. But this is truth that we're singing. This is what God has done for us. Just look at those words there. When the Prince of Life, our ransom, shared for us his precious blood. That's incredible that we can sing that, isn't it? And know the reality and the power of what that means for each one of us who is in Christ. Here is love, vast as the ocean. Josh, for that encouragement to think about what we're singing. Uh, my congregation certainly knows that I can get lost a little bit from time to time and lose my place in the service because I just caught up in the hymnody. Uh, what a lovely song. And earlier we sang, what a Savior. What a Savior indeed, and what a salvation. Uh, Joshua mentioned earlier that on a Good Friday, of course, we 
take into consideration the cost of our salvation. But part of taking in that cost of salvation, I think, is understanding its blessings as well. And who would we be to neglect so great a salvation? And so tonight, I will actually focus probably a little bit more on some of the blessings of the cross. Turn with me, please, to Mark 15. I'll be reading from verse 33, and this is God's word. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Well, on that fateful first Good Friday from the sixth hour, that being noon, of course, there was this three-hour period of darkness fell over the land, a darkness even the midday sun could not overcome. It was a darkness beyond natural. All of the gospel writers speak of it. Well, some 33 years earlier, you might recall, of course, that there was a heavenly brightness and song even at midnight at the birth of the one whose cross of death was now overshadowed by darkness at noon. And it was a darkness of mourning. Morning meaning sadness, not morning as time of day, a darkness of morning. Like Amos, who promised, prophesied, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will make it like the morning for an only sun. But besides mourning, besides a lament, it was also representing a curse, the curse of God. For it was God's judgment poured out in spite of that midday light that brought the darkness. Isaiah had prophesied of a suffering servant upon whom the Lord would lay the iniquity of us all. We heard from that in Isaiah 52 and 3. Paul, of course, in the New Testament would later confirm Jesus that he was the one for our sake. God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. Think about those three hours. During those three hours came relentless sin upon an innocent man. Your sin, my sin, the sin indeed of all the world. All of the hatred, All of the murder, jealousy, pride, envy, theft, lies, slander, all of the idolatry, every last bit of it laid upon one faultless man, coming upon him, cascading as a waterfall. And who was this man? None other than the man who had done nothing but the will of his father, the one who had an intimacy and a oneness and a, with this holiness, this perfect holiness, God. His beauty, his love, his excellencies, beyond anything any one of us could ever imagine. That's what he knew. 
the fellowship with the Father. The one who in the beginning was both with God and was God. It's no exaggeration to say he had never experienced even one instant without the fellowship of God. And so now in the darkness of the cross, Jesus is alone. It's no wonder that his first cry that Mark records is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cries out in prayer. I imagine him searching through all of the scriptures. Where do I land? And he lands, of course, at Psalm 22, verse 1. Calvin explains it this way. Jesus simply had to express the horror of this great darkness, this God forsakenness, by quoting the only verse of Scripture that actually described it, and which he had perfectly fulfilled. Mark records one more cry, a last cry. He alludes to it in verse 37 of the text I just read. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. I love how Mark records that, breathed his last. His last breath was not stolen from him. He gave up that last breath, and he gave it up for you and for me. He said to his spirit, as much as to the world, it is finished. And again, he gave his life. I used to wonder, I wasn't raised in a Christian family, but I, I'm old enough to remember when, even in Canada, we would have Christian assemblies at Christian holiday times of the year. And I always wondered, why did they call it Good Friday? Perhaps you wonder the same thing, but it's because Jesus' death is not a tragedy, a triumph. It is a triumph. Christ accomplished his death, the scriptures say. He finished what he came to do. And then it's at this point that we come to the focus of my efforts tonight. Mark tells us in verse 38 that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Your translation may say veil. I'll probably use both words tonight, veil, curtain. I want us to understand what that veil was. I want to un understand uh, why it was torn at the death of Christ, and, of course, why is it meaningful for us? Well, firstly, this veil, this curtain. It's described first and most thoroughly in the Old Testament when we come to the building of the tabernacle, the establishing of the tabernacle. That's where we find the description of the veil. You can find that in Exodus 26. Well, what's the tabernacle, you might say? Well, it was basically God's provision for God's people. He had covenanted with them. He said, I'm your God, and I want you to be my people. And, of course, God is always faithful to his covenants, but his people are not. And so he had a problem. How does a holy God live with such unholy, sinful people? And his answer was the tabernacle. He didn't, as you might guess, a God might say, I'm going to shun you if you're going to continue to reject me, if you're going to sin against my ways and my values, if you're not going to honor the covenant you make with me, then I'll shun you. But he does actually the exact opposite. He says, I'm going to dwell in the midst of you. But there's a catch. Of course there would be, because he's holy and they're sinful. He dwells in the midst of them by establishing a place of his presence. And that was in the tabernacle. Uh, you may know that there were several sections of the tabernacle with increasing restrictions in terms of access. In the center was the place where the priests would do the priestly duties, the holy place. Within the holy place, right in the center was the holy of holies. And it's here where we see the veil. That's the veil separating the Holy of Holies from the holy place. <clears throat> the Holy of Holies, I said the holy place was for priests. 
the Holy of Holies actually was fully restricted, with one exception. We read about this as well earlier from Leviticus. The high priest could go into the Holy of Holies once a year during Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, and he would make then a sacrifice on behalf of the nation. But even that high priest, the one person, the one time of the year when he was allowed to go in, had to go in fully prepared. He had to wear certain things. He had to consecrate himself certain acts of uh, rites of purity that he had to pass through to make sure that he was ready to go into the presence of God. Well, this veil then had the effect of reminding everyone of this restriction, it would remind them of the sacredness of God, the holiness of God, and in that way, separate from me. Exodus 26 tells us about its crafting. It was made by the finest craftsmen of the land. The veil was hung by gold hooks on acacia wood, which was also encased with gold. It was made of the finest of linens. Behind it was placed the Ark of the Covenant. In Solomon's temple, which was patterned after that first tabernacle, the veil was described, its colors were described. You can read of this in 2 Chronicles chapter 3. It was described as blue and purple and crimson, again, of fine yarn and fine linen. And it makes note also that cherubim were sewn in, embroidered into this veil. Now, when I say veil or curtain, we can't be thinking of a bridal veil, something flimsy or translucent. This was heavy. Uh, the earliest uh, Jewish historians made note that this was of a, a thickness of 9 or 10 centimeters. This is a heavy, heavy veil. Beautifully done, beautifully crafted. I mentioned the cherubim. These are important symbols. They were symbols of the protection of God's presence. You might recall from Genesis chapter 3, after the fall of man, what does God place on the outside of the garden, the place of God's presence? But cherubim, they are to mind after the garden, keep it pure. The garden, of course, was the place where heaven and earth, in a way, are fused. God's presence on earth. Back to the color. Today, of course, we think of those colors, crimson and purple and blue, purple especially, as being royal, and back then it was no different. Like today, they had the same idea of color. This place then was the place where a heavenly king would take an earthly throne in the midst of his people. Well, that's the fact and the function of the veil. I said we talk also about what does it mean to us. What does it mean to us? Well, I think we're going to see three ways. I was thinking just leading into Resurrection Sunday of that great verse in Romans 6. Um, Paul talks about us being not only baptized into the death of Christ, but also into his resurrection, saying that we walk then in newness of life. What a wonderful little phrase to have newness of life. I don't know about you, but I am happy for newness of life, that old things are passed away and that I can walk in the new things of God. Well, I think we see a taste of that, and there's so much that we could cover, of course, about the cross, but I want to note three ways in which we see newness at the cross. A new way to God, a new understanding of God, and then a new invitation from God. Firstly, a new way to God. And here's where I'm going to borrow a little bit from Hebrews 10 that Josh read from earlier. Hebrews 10, 19 and 20 say this. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is... Through the flesh. 
You know, in many ways, Jesus spoke of worship in a new way. He spoke of a new way of worship. The temple, I think it would be fair to say, was waning in its influence and its place as the center of true worship. Luke's gospel, for instance, in chapter 13, we read of Jesus lamenting, having that great sorrow over Jerusalem and its temple. He even says that, uh, this is in chapter 13, um, that it's forsaken, that the house of God is forsaken. When he comes upon, when Jesus comes upon the temple, a temple that is bustling with corruption, corrupt trading, corrupt religious commercialism, Mark tells us Jesus' condemning words. They have made God's house, God's house of prayer into a den of thieves. Of that same episode, John's gospel records Jesus saying, destroy this temple, this temple of brick and mortar that you see, and in three days, I will raise it up. The religious leaders, of course, were blind and couldn't understand what he was saying. They challenged him. It took 46 years, they say, for Herod to rebuild this this temple. But of course, John helps us as the reader, telling us that he was speaking of his own body. So in a way, already casting hints in this direction that that the temple is not what we thought it was. Chapter 4, of course, we come again in John's Gospel to the question of worship with the woman at the well. And what does she say? Well, she being from Samaria has this question on her mind. She wants to know about who's right. My fathers or our fathers, or yeah, my fathers would say we worship in this mountain, but you, pointing to Jesus, say you should worship in Jerusalem. What, who's right? And haven't we heard these kinds of religious arguments? Who's right? And Jesus said simply, there would come a day, in fact, now is when true worshipers would worship in spirit and in truth, and it's these worshipers whom the Father seeks. And then finally, Mark, our gospel writer of note tonight. Mark has this scene that's unique to him. Again, following uh, his triumphal entry, following the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem. We've got the adulation of the crowds. We've got the hosannas ringing out. The cries then for deliverance and salvation. It's a wondrous time. And Mark is the only one who has this little tiny scene. It's like one verse long at the end of chapter 11. And he says simply that Jesus came into the temple. Mark tells us it's late. It's late in the day. And there's this incredible sense of emptiness. He simply looks around and leaves. No worshipers to be found. And most importantly, no presence to be found. As if Ichabod has been written over this house. The glory of God had departed for this reason, that there was with Jesus a new and living way, a way to get to the true and living God who, not, who does not indwell bricks and mortar, physical structure, but a church made up of men and women like you and me, all walks of life, united to Christ, who have through the flesh of Christ have gained access to God's life and God's blessings. Well, what are these blessings? He speaks of a new and a living way, a new way. Well, there's a new access to God, he says, through his flesh. So clearly through the sacrifice that he makes on the cross, we have in some way some access to God. And of course, it was once our flesh that in a way veiled us from God, separated us from God. Because that's what sin does. It always separates us from God. For one, just out of necessity, because a holy God cannot be in the same place as sin. But of course, we know that it's even our own shame that keeps us from God as well. 
when we're caught in sin. And so this veil being torn, imagine those people. Imagine the people that would have grown up knowing about the purpose of the veil, the function of the veil. Imagine those worshipers, even the best of those worshipers, every time. And, and it wasn't just, they wouldn't just interact in a sense by faith in the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement. There were regular offerings coming for guilt and, and for sin as well. And let's just say you're, you're just a regular head of household and you're bringing your offering to the priest in the temple And what you see in that distance, it seems so distant. You know what is there behind the veil, the Holy of Holies, that place where only one man can go once a year, the presence of God, the ark of God, and you're here. And what stands in between you and there is, of course, your sin. And the necessity, of course, of a sacrifice. And so you bring that sacrifice in faith, trusting that God would cover your sin again. And so this new way, this new access was a remarkable thing that that you're telling us that that which we were never allowed to, to go into, not even to really fully appropriate the, the, the blessing of God, it would just cover our sin, not remove it, And now you're telling me I have access into that most precious place. What a a salvation we have. So this is a new way that we have, but it's also a living way. And that reminds us, I think, that this isn't just something that we take by faith on a one-off basis. To just live by faith. This is a living faith that we have. A living faith that we apply to our daily lives. And so for in all of those ways that in a day-to-day basis that we know that we again bring shame and disrepute to the God whose name we say we live for and under, there's that living way that we still have on a daily basis, the just live by faith. And it's our right and privilege to come to this new way. Secondly, we find a new understanding, a new understanding of God. We have a new way to God, but a new understanding of God. I think Mark's account in particular points us toward this idea of a a revelation, of a new understanding of God. I quoted, um, I mentioned Josephus, I think, earlier. He talks about that veil as a representation of of sky because of its colors, because of the cherubim. It it represented the heavens to the Israelites. Well, Mark, I think, makes a connection between the veil and the heavens himself. Firstly, think of the title of the Son of God, how important it is for Mark. How does he start his gospel? He says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then he goes to his baptism straight away in verse 9 of chapter 1. And it says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. And so we see this picture at Jesus' baptism of the heavens being torn and a voice declaring, this is my beloved son. What do we see at his death? Well, the veil, that representation of the heavens torn, torn open in the declaration from a Roman centurion, truly this man was the son of God. Through the tearing of the heavens, we have the announcement of of an identity, the announcement of who this Jesus Christ is, that he's God's son, first at his baptism, then the centurion at his death. And it's interesting that it's only at this point in the Gospel of Mark that we hear a human saying those words, this is the son of God. It's a revelation that comes to this man through the heavens 
Now, we do hear it, of course, in chapter 1, as I said, at his baptism. We hear the spirits supernaturally discerning in chapter 3 that this man who's come to crush them, evil spirits recognize him as the Son of God. And Jesus himself, to the high priest, calls himself the Son of God. But it's the Roman centurion, a Gentile Roman centurion, who first has the revelation that this indeed is no mere man. He was God the Son. And it's because of the cross, because of the light of the cross, because seeing the work of the cross through God the Son, that he sees, I think, the necessity that this must be indeed God the Son. Now, why am I making much of this? Well, God the Son, certainly there's an element of relationship there. And it's it's beautiful. It's eternal. There never was a time when God the Son was not in relationship other than the cross um, with God the Father. It's an amazing thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's it's a relationship that is in a way self-sustaining. But it's more than that. This sonship spoke to a title, an identity that was necessary to, to complete the work of the cross And so it was a title, not just the announcement of a relationship. It announced his lordship. It told us of his character. told us of his messiahship. You know, just for example, if if you were standing outside Buckingham Palace, for instance, and you'd, you'd like to go in, and a guy is at the gate, he's got his hand in his pocket, a cigarette kind of dangling from his mouth, and says, hey, bud, you want to go in? Yeah, it's free today. Just go right on in. Are you going to take his word for it? But what if you see a Bentley coming to the same gate, rolls down the window, and I can't do a posh RP accent, but it's King Charles saying, oh, hi, sir, would you like to come in with me? You're in then. That's the difference. He's got the authority to make that announcement. He's got got the authority to tell you that you have access. That's why it's so important, this revelation that the centurion had, that that Mark wants us to have, that this is the Son of God. And it's why that sacrifice on the cross frees us and liberates us and grants us access. It's why Jesus, of course, could say that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except through me. So we see a new way to God. We see a new revelation of God. And finally, I think we see a new invitation from God. Uh, We'll turn back to Hebrews 10 here and read from verse 21. He says, And since we have a great priest, a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Again, that veil was a physical, visible reminder constantly that access to God was prohibited because he was holy and we are not. And having access now through the flesh of Christ, through the sacrifice of Christ, doesn't mean that God has changed. It's really important to know that. He is still the holy God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament. If your God has to be different between old and new, I think we have a theological problem because he's a God who changes not. He's still holy. He is still holy. What does change is, of course, our access, as we've just noted. It's through that death of God the Son that the wrath and judgment of God against sin has been satisfied gloriously, once and for all. Once and for all, in a way that the blood of animals could never do. Jesus, the perfect high priest, in a way, has has gone in for us. He's gone in for us to make that way, to make for us the perfect sacrifice for sin. And the consequence of this is the great, I think, the great application and challenge for us tonight. Since if we have such a great high priest, do we draw near? 
do we draw near? This is the new invitation from God, to draw near and to draw near with confidence. And I think this remains, even to this day, a great challenge in the church because it's a great challenge to our hearts. Perhaps we wonder, what is the nature of God? What is his disposition to us? You know, the writer Thomas Hardy suggested that God is marked by heartless indifference. And that sounds so cold and blasphemous, but sometimes I wonder of my own heart. Could somebody accuse me of being, um, of, of seeing God in that way that he's indifferent to me? We wonder perhaps behind this veil of mystery, who is this God? Is he a God that wants to hear me pray? Is he a God who can do something when I pray? Is he a God who actually knows something, anything about little old me and my little old life? Is he a God who cares when my heart is broken or when my burden seems heavy? Is he a God who knows anything of the misery and brokenness of this world? Is he a God within whom I can find hope? when I've messed things up so badly that I hate myself? Has he got anything to calm the fear or strengthen the weakness or provide cleansing forgiveness when I feel vulnerable, when I feel, feel tired, when I feel ashamed? And I think if we're honest, too many of us in the midst of these questions still see a veil. We see a thick mysterious veil that hides a mysterious God behind it. In every case, in every question, to every hurt, to every pain, to every sin, to all despair, there is no answer. There is no answer but the cross. Trusting in that finished work of the cross tears that veil for you on a personal level opens the heavens as it did for that centurion and convinces our hearts of his passion for us, convinces our hearts that he is indeed the one who loved us and gave himself for us. The one who is for us, not against us. The one who says, draw near, please, would you draw near? There should be really no question of his commitment to us. If we question God's commitment to us, if we question if he's for us or against us, it can only be that we're not looking at the cross. If we're not looking at the cross and the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us, we will still see that veil intact. You'll see a God of mystery. I know there are mysterious things about God, and I know I have known personal struggles, and I don't always have answers even for my own struggles. As a pastor, often I'm praying with knees shaking as I'm giving counsel. Life is hard. It's really hard. But there are things that we know. We know he is our God, and we are his people. And if we're still looking for a religion to make us feel better about our approach to God, we're looking in the wrong places. We have to start with the the simple promise of God that he has come to dwell with us. I mentioned the garden, of course, the sin of chapter 3, but the glory of chapters 1 and 2 where we have perfect communion. Our long ago parents, perfect communion with a God who is with them. That's the ideal. And Revelation 21, we won't turn there, but Revelation 21 tells us of all things that God's dwelling place is with man, verse 3. And that if we're looking for a temple, if we're looking for a form of religion to get close to God, we'll not find one. 
verses 22 and 23 of Revelation 21 say, I saw no temple in the city. We start with a garden, we end with a city. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Jesus said, when I'm lifted up, that's of course pointing to himself, being lifted up on the cross, I will draw all people to myself. I think that speaks both of his intentions and both, both of his intentions and our natural reaction when we see the cross and the Son of God on the cross. It is natural for us to respond by drawing near. It's the cross that draws us. It's work represented by that torn veil, making a new way for us to God. It speaks of a new revelation of God, and it gives us a new invitation. There's no longer any overshadowing darkness over those who trust in Christ. Whatever darkness you had, have, or will have, will you believe God? Will you believe God tonight? Will you believe God tomorrow? Will you trust Christ? Will you draw near? Will you yield to his drawing? As we close tonight, we're, we're going to close with a hymn that I'm going to borrow some lyric from. Curtain torn in two, dead are raised to life. Finished the victory cry, this the power of the cross. Oh, to see my name written in the wounds. For through your suffering I am free. Death is crushed to death. Life is mine to live. One through your selfless love, this power of the cross. Son of God slain for us. What a love. What a cost. We stand forgiven at the cross. Brethren, you know, for those of you perhaps that don't trust in Christ, I really respect that you're here tonight. But I want you to think, where do I see my name written? Can you imagine your name being written in the blood of Christ? Can you imagine the power of the cross for the sake of your name written in his wounds through his suffering setting you free? If you have any questions on anything that we've sung about, prayed about, preached about tonight, I'd love to talk to you afterward. God does love you. Let's uh, stand if we're able to sing our closing hymn, Oh to See the Dawn.
Lord, we do thank you for the power of the cross. We do thank you for every wound. We thank you for bearing each and every sin, each and every person, each and every sin. What a wonderful Savior, what a wonderful salvation. And I'll now pray from, again, the words of Isaiah from chapter 43. Do not be afraid, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters and great trouble, trouble, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I pray that that is true for you tonight. And go, please, in the peace of the Savior. You are deeply loved.